welcome everyone to the ILSS webinar. My name is Sangeeta and I'm your host for today's session. Uh, our webinar today is by Leila Dhyabji, uh, chairperson and co-founder of Daskar. And we're really honored to have her with us today. Before I hand over to our guest, I would like to take a couple of minutes to just uh, introduce you to India Leaders for Social Sector. ILSS or India Leaders for Social Sector is a non-profit uh, leadership development and um, learning organization that was set up uh, a little over a, two, a little over two years ago to build leaders, uh, leadership capacity for India's social sector. Our um, offerings include the nine-day ILSS leadership program, a unique um, residential experience for leaders from various sectors, including corporates. Um, the armed forces, government, and various other sectors and with various backgrounds to actually develop a deeper understanding of social uh, issues and consider taking up leadership roles in the development sector. Uh, we are also in the process of rolling out a range of uh, learning programs uh, meant to build specific capacities within the social sector, uh, including fundraising. Uh, we will be launching a fundraising program shortly, so do watch out for that. Uh, ILSS Online is our uh, latest offering, which includes the uh, webinar series, uh, which uh, is an endeavor to really bring together voices and perspectives from leaders, experts, influencers across sectors uh, to help us build perspectives on um, pressing issues that are relevant to our times and our context, uh, so that we may um, respond, uh, more, respond better to them. For those of you who are interested, um, our ILSS leadership program is, um, we're going to hold the next edition of our uh, nine day program in August 2020. Uh, we're currently in the process of receiving and reviewing applications for the same. So uh, do visit our website or one of our uh, social media platforms to look up uh, more information on the program. Uh, and. Uh, apply. Uh, if you have any more questions, my, uh, our, our team would be happy to help. We also have a couple of interesting webinars lined up after today's session with uh, uh, Leila. We have uh, Professor and Economist uh, Karthik Murlidharan, uh, who will speak about uh, what Indian states uh, might be uh, doing uh, to build, rebuild their governance and finance um, uh, as they emerge from the um, uh, from the pandemic, we also have a session by Shaheen Mistri, um, founder and CEO of Teach for India, who will speak about reimagining education for the post-COVID world. Uh, do register for these uh, sessions, and we look forward to seeing you there. Back to today's session, we are, we are really delighted to have uh, Leila Tayabji with us. Leila, of course, is the chairperson of the much-loved brand called Daskar. Uh, she's one of the co-founders. She's a craft designer, writer, uh, and has worked for over four decades with grassroots art artisans um, across India. Uh, many of her uh, projects have involved creating new livelihood uh, opportunities uh, through craft for pastoral and marginalized rural communities uh, such as bonded labor in Bihar, uh, displaced villagers in uh, Rantambore, embroidery artisans in Kutch, uh, tribals in Odisha, victims of insurgency in Kashmir. Uh, and so on. Leila studied art in Baroda and Japan and has worked as a freelance designer in textiles, graphics, uh, interiors and theatre prior to setting up Dust Sky. Uh, in 2012, Leila was uh, awarded the Padma Shri in recognition of her uh, tremendous, um, incredible work in the space of reviving India's handicrafts. Um, so thank you Leila for accepting our invitation to speak uh, today and um, over to you. Thank you. I don't think I need to say any more now. You've said it all. But I'm delighted to be here with all of you. And, uh, you know, Zoom is today the window to our communicating with other people. And so to celebrate the occasion, I've worn a really bright sari and I've even spritzed on some scent just to feel good. I'm supposed to talk to you about Daskar's work with craftspeople, particularly in the context of COVID-19 and the lockdown. Now, all of us, I think, 
couldn't really uh, help being moved unless we had hearts of stone seeing the daily labor wending their way back to their villages and encountering so many difficulties so much pain suffering hunger along the way but i think that not many indians particularly those in urban india realize that there's another very large and unfortunately generally unseen and anonymous group of people who've been affected quite as badly by the lockdown and those are india's craft people and weavers craft people although they have such extraordinary skills and are part of our culture our heritage our aesthetic and of course our economy as well are somehow never heard of and though lot of us value what they make we don't really think too much about the craft people themselves there's a paradox here because actually indian craft people are the second largest sector of employment in our country there are millions of them another paradox is that we actually don't even know how many they are because they have never been tabulated in the census it's only the primary sort of uh, home owner who's counted and all the ancillary labor the unpaid labor the people who spin the people who wash the people who turn the lathes who cure the wood who repair the looms those are never tabulated and there's an estimate that there are actually about 12 people involved in every craft process who are not counted according to government figures they say there are about 10 to 12 million approximately according to figures that uh, many uh, of us who work in the craft sector have put together it's more like 200 million so now that's an extraordinary thing and these people and since we are talking in the context of covid uh, these people have fallen between the security net of whatever few government schemes they are they don't come under manrega they, they are not because they are not below the poverty line most of them they don't come to msme because they are not registered as such they are what is known as informal sector and as a result they have been terribly badly hit by what has happened of course they've lost their sales uh, because all the markets are closed they have lost their orders both national and international because people have cancelled those orders because most of the stores and market places are closed they have also no access to raw material or money to buy raw material so they really can't even get into production for when this you know mythical date of when bazaars and melas and shops and stores really reopen properly and there's a huge question mark on what this market eventually is going to be because unfortunately craft is no longer an essential commodity and i think it would be very naive for us to think that the minute all the restrictions are over that people are going to come rushing again to bazaars and melas to buy craft it isn't a priority for them everyone's pockets are pinched these days as a result of this two month uh, cessation of any business and also because unfortunately people have begun to think of craft as something decorative something ornamental something not really necessary to our lives as far as i am concerned this is absolutely not true and i think that if indians were suddenly deprived of craft they would really realize what a intrinsic and important part of our lives it is even the people who don't wear sarees even the men who wear bush shirts and trousers you know they wear a handloom they use a handloom towel they sit on a mora chair they may eat out of a thal they uh, use all kinds of utensils uh, traditional and non traditional made out of crafted materials they give gifts 
no wedding is complete no uh, puja is complete without crafted products but as i said people take them absolutely for granted and don't realize what an important part of our lives they are and even more than the craft products they don't realize how vital craft people are and that if craft people suddenly disappeared today i mean it would not only mean that we wouldn't have these extraordinary things to buy and use but a huge chunk of india's exports would disappear a huge chunk of our gdp would disappear and it's really time that we started taking them a little more seriously but whenever we discuss all this with anybody whether it's an economist a bureaucrat or a politician they have this feeling that oh indian crafts have been around for 5000 years crafts people are always there you know there's no need to do it i think frankly this is absolute folly because at a time when india in the beginning of the 21st century is still trying to catch up with a lot of the development uh, developed world in many aspects of life and we're investing huge amounts of money in order to do that here we have a gold mine of anywhere as i said you know but literally hundreds of millions of craft people who have the capacity and have extraordinary skills and who have techniques and traditions which go back yes 5000 years but are still very valid and relevant to the consumer society of today and since consumerism is a human um, instinct which is very difficult to put down uh, actually when you look at the international markets for them india is really a space where you can still get hand embroidery still place where you can get a you know a hand molded piece of copper somewhere where a, a craftsman can make you a door or a pillar who can actually make a whole temple if you want in stone or wood or whatever these are things which very few countries have now uh, i've used this word paradox at least twice or thrice and i'm going to use it again because for me this actually describes this country of ours how we just don't see things which should be seen and we manage to make negatives out of positives and are not so good at turning negatives into positives so uh, i mean for me i think it's uh, the way that the average indian looks at the at craft people is just the way that an average indian looks at say the kutub minar uh, we know it's there we maybe even pass it on our way to our office but we will rush all the way to italy to look at the leaning tower of pizza or you know to big ben in london both of which i think are architecturally much less impressive but we won't actually think of getting into our car and taking our kids to go and look at this amazing and incredible piece of architecture which is also and crafted so similarly we ignore this gold mine and i can't tell you how many bureaucrats over the 45 years that i've been working in the sector when you talk of the craft sector they sort of look at you and they say oh you know here is one of these romantic ladies you know who just wants to be nostalgic about our past and you know craft people they are yes they are picturesque they are useful for tourism but you know don't try and sell me craft people as an economic alternative and when i quote figures to them and say that you know here's a sector which since the first five year plan the contribution from the government investment in the sector has steadily decreased from i think 3 and a half percent of the budget to something 00 point i don't know what is difficult these days even to find craft sector in the budget and yet its contribution to our gdp and our exports has been rising percentage wise now isn't that a paradox for you isn't that an argument for investment of course it is but they won't see it a very senior bureaucrat has actually said oh it's a sunset industry you know it has to sink until then we'll prop it up with subsidies and things 
to invest in craft people. So anyway, that's the background in which we all work and that's the background in which craft people have to survive. So let's move on a little bit to now the current situation. If COVID has a plus, which is rather difficult to see today, it is maybe that it's a time to pause and reflect. I think all of us have had that time to sort of think about what we're doing and how we should do it and what is both wrong with the world and ourselves. Now, how much of this introspection is going to remain in our minds when we get out into the mainstream again? I'm not sure. There are days I feel optimistic and there are days when I feel very bleak indeed. I suppose it depends which side of my bed I got out of. But uh, I hope that some of this will stick and that we can think about the fact that when the whole world is in lockdown, human beings, which of course need each other, but they also need other things in order to live, not just food, but many other things. And that if the international, if the global market is not accessible and you can't fly, you can't shop, you can't what? What is there? And how fortunate we are in India that we do have so many people who can make the things that we need in order to live comfortably and well and in some style. Uh, I'm not saying that everything in India has to turn handcrafted. That would be silly. And I'm not at all wanting to turn back the clock on all the development that has been done in the world. I mean, the fact that I'm speaking to all of you today is because of the technology that we have uh, acquired and for which India is known. But I do think that part of creating this new world post COVID is again thinking, make local, buy local. And while for many other countries all over the world, this may be very difficult because they've really stopped all that type of local production. And they're so dependent on imports and things. I mean, the whole US policy towards China is an example of how they actually don't have the strength and the ability to say bugger off China, however much they would like to. Now in India, we do have that. We have, of course, we have our own industries, we have the manufacturing, everything. But we also have these millions of craftspeople who can enhance life and also generate a lot of income for us by exporting what they make to other countries. Uh, I was one of Midnight's children. I was born in 1947. So I've actually seen the trajectory of India and so I find it a little ironic now that we are talking so much about, you know, make in India and Swadeshi and self-reliance, you know, these as if they were newly coined, amazing ideas. Because actually when India start, became independent in 47 and for at least the first 30 years, uh, this self-reliance and make in India was a fundament of our development policy. And that's the reason today that we have so many things and that we're, which we make in India ourselves, both manufactured goods as well as handcraft. And I think that's a huge opportunity for us. I think we should be seizing it with both hands. But in order to do that, we cannot expect, you know, self-reliance from the word go in every single Indian, just as we realize that those daily laborers walking homewards cannot be self-reliant unless they have a job somewhere at the end of the line, unless they have food along the line, unless they have some security for their families and themselves. And craftspeople are in the same boat today. They need to be invested in if they're going to become this really productive, useful, profit, revenue generating part of our society in the way that they used to be. In the 17th century, India was one of the richest countries in the world and its products went all over 
the globe and somebody some frenchman actually said that you know oh every person in the universe from cape comoran to uh, paris and copenhagen is dressed in indian muslin i don't see why that shouldn't be the case again and why we shouldn't realize that we you need to use the power and the potential of all these millions of hands but in order to do that you have to put something in their hand first so that they can buy the raw material you need to give them sort of r and d about what is going on in the international marketplace in our own metro markets you need to give them design and you also have to give them some amount of technology i think again it's a very short sighted idea that a cross person is only a cross person if he's sitting on some pavement with some very primitive tools and whittling away at a piece of wood uh, there's no reason that he can't be given proper tools proper equipment some sort of uh, electrification or whatever he does or she does it doesn't distract from the fact that the thing is handcrafted what does handcraft actually mean it means a product which cannot be made without the intellectual and creative input of a human being and that cannot be replicated endlessly through a machine process and so if that process was aided by a little technology or it was made a little more ergonomic i don't see why that should be then not considered a craft and it would also encourage a lot of younger people to come back into the sector because when they see their fathers and their grandfathers bent over a loom and you know uh, laboring away over something getting tb or whatever from working over a furnace open furnace it isn't very attractive so i do think that uh, we need to think of all this uh, if you ask craft people to themselves and when they walk into our daskar office asking for help from us if you say what do you need the answer of course always is marketing they need to sell but actually marketing is just one bit of a sort of of a circle of activity you know you can give them the best space in connaught place so uh, and unless they have the right thing to sell and its quality and it also appeals to a customer and it has both beauty and functionality and a certain amount of contemporary appeal it's not going to sell so you do need design you need product development you need market information you need packaging you need presentation it's very sad actually that most craft products are sold and i say it myself that in a kind of bazaar like situation i don't think daska sells craft in a bazaar because we think that's the best place for it to be it's very hot very often it's very sunny it's sometimes dusty it's uh, difficult to do proper displays and presentation in that kind of environment and it does mean that uh, you know value added expensive products or designer project products don't sell there because you are not able to present them in the way that today's customer has got used to having designer products displayed the other thing which falls out of a bazaar or a craft emporium the state emporiums and things are functional crafts because those depend on volume you really cannot fill a state a boutique or a state emporium with endless baskets and jharus but those are also crafted they also need a market or furniture even you'd say uh, you know a lot of uh, merchandisers for instance will see wonderful uh, wood carving skills and say uh, no no don't make furniture because furniture is too bulky where will we keep it how will we sell it so they the craft gets reduced to smaller and smaller things an example is the papier mache of kashmir beautiful hand painted thing very few people today 
who buy a little sort of Christmas tree decoration or a sort of napkin ring or some a little pill box made out of papier mache realized that papier mache was originally an architectural skill and it was used to decorate the roofs and walls of Kashmiri houses and temple and masjids and temples and palaces. It was used to make tables and chairs and screens until just about a hundred years ago. But then gradually it became, you know, particularly international merchandisers came in and reduced this to smaller and smaller and more and more volume. I have a real problem with this whole concept of craft being produced in hundreds of pieces or thousands of pieces and all costing under two dollars or whatever. It's, it's a real shortcut and it's a waste of the skill because actually what is the USP of craft is that each piece can individually be different. It's a way of getting a unique product made exclusively for yourself or for your own use, which nobody else can have and which is the ultimate idea of luxury. But who today thinks of craft as luxury? We think of it as a little gift item or knick-knack, you know, and that basically also has to be rather cheap. Now that's not the way to go if you want to do craft development. You have to invest in the craftsperson, you have to invest in the product and you have to see that what is the strength, you have to build on the strengths of everything when you're planning, whether you're planning your own life or your daughter's wedding or your sort of uh, a craftsperson's future, you have to see what are the pluses, what are the assets that you can bring to this process and how can you build on that not just on the negatives by saying, oh, this craftsperson is illiterate, they're very poor, you know, they don't have access, they don't know how to use a computer. You know. So let's get them to make this little object and let's sell it uh, using that poverty button as a kind of way to arouse a customer's interest and sympathy. I think that's completely the wrong way. And I do hope that we'll start thinking about this again. So what are craftspeople today themselves doing in this lockdown period? How are they thinking about their future? Well, the first couple of um, weeks or almost the first month was actually spent by them just trying to sort out their lives and get enough food and sort of supplies, medical supplies and hygiene supplies for their families and themselves. And so that for Daskar also was actually in a way one of the easiest bits because we raised money, people were very generous and we sent out, I think we have sent out relief supplies to about 14 states uh, all over the country and several thousands of craftspeople. And because we're an NGO, again, you know, your negative turns into a positive. So because we are small uh, and because the money was private donations, we were able to send it out with speed. The, the amounts were obviously not comparable to what government agencies or international agencies could do. But we were able to literally, somebody would phone us and by the next evening, the money was in their bag because we worked so closely with them, we had all those details of their PAN numbers, their bank accounts, etc. So sending it, the process was not too much. We had an accounts department which was sympathetic and was accepting appeals even on WhatsApp. They were not saying that we have to have it in triplicate form, you know, filled up. So, uh, as I said, that bit was good and it made us feel good that we were able to respond quite fast but um, the tricky bit comes now which what happens the government schemes of uh, relief schemes have more or less uh, kicked in so i don't think anyone is dying of hunger now but how do they face this new world and this new market we talked a little bit about that but 
I think that is most of the discussions that I've been having with um, our cross people is that uh, they also realize that the world is going to be a different place. The marketplace is going to be quite different. Strategies and products which worked before may not work so well. And so what are we doing about it? Daska's response has been, well, the very obvious one that we have to go online. Uh, something that we've been not resisting, but a little nervous about for some time. I mean, it did seem the obvious thing. And yet buying craft is such a touchy feely thing. And we really wondered whether the online experience could possibly replicate that experience of coming to a really a live situation where you're interacting with craftspeople, you're seeing what they make, you're hearing the stories of how they learn to make it, what are the significance of the symbols in it, all that, that whole package, which is the essence of purchasing a craft product, the history of it, the personal stories of it. So we wondered, how can you do this? And frankly, when I looked at other online sites selling craft, I was not very inspired because some of the things look very flat and um, it didn't have the raunak and the romance somehow of going out and purchasing yourself. But I think we have to do it. I think we have to grit our teeth and realize that, uh, that customers are not going to come rushing out to a crafts mailer, a crowded crafts mailer and spend time, you know, uh, in the outdoors. Uh, and that for crafts people also to come from their remote places and travel is quite dangerous for them to do. And uh, coming from villages, they're actually more vulnerable to infection than those of us who develop some sort of immunity. Uh, so we are uh, going online. We started in a very small way, already putting a few things up and having uh, people, you know, pay for it now and get it later. I and mean, then once the courier services start working, uh, we do hope to have a full website with a kind of online daskar, which we hope in a way to make a, a kind of like a virtual bazaar where you actually also have videos of the craftspeople showing their products, talking about them, letting the customer interact perhaps in some way and say, oh, I see something very interesting behind you, show me that, or can't you make it in blue instead of red or whatever. I mean, all these are details that have to be worked. And of course, being the sky, we have no money to do it, but we are trying. Uh, because I think that is the need of the hour. I mean, cast people at the moment need work. They're not getting orders. Uh, and I don't blame boutique owners and exporters and things for that. Because if their own shops and stores are closed and they have an obligation to pay their staff and pay their rent, you can't really expect them to be ordering also and investing in stock. Um, the textile minister did give us a sharp talking to and saying that, you know, don't cancel your orders, don't do that. And I think designers were quite upset because they felt she hadn't really understood that that is easier said than done. And she's, that I think everyone, not just class people, but small businesses, designers, entrepreneurs, all need support at this time if you want them to fulfill their long-term commitment. And um, again, to say that, okay, you're going online, you're helping craftspeople with some finance. We are now starting giving out small amounts of money for to them so that they can buy raw material and they can pay some wages to their ancillary craftspeople. But there is also that, what do they make? And there's several schools of thought. There's been a lot of discussion about this. We had a long session with craftspeople from Kutch yesterday evening, uh, 
in a very interesting discussion. Um, my take on it is that let's not go either this way or that way and say, oh, people are hard up, so let's make cheap things, small things that people want to buy and uh, where they don't have to invest, or go the other way and say, oh, let's not make all the things that we used to make before, let's just make, you know, really expensive value added product which will show something and that if we sell one we are okay for the rest of the month. I think you have to have a range because one of the strengths of India is that its markets are on very many levels and I'm not just talking about the look, the village heart or even the small town market or whatever but even in sit metro cities like Delhi, Bombay, Bangalore, you have places where you can sell products at very different price ranges and have very different people coming in. It's always fascinating to me that here you are in Delhi, you have, uh, you know, you have the Central Cottage Industries Emporium, which is considered, and you have the sort of the Baba Karak Singh craft stores, which are supposed to be quite stylish and expensive and things. And of course, you have the hotel arcades, the Imperial Hotel, whatever. And then you have Khadi Bhandar, which is selling Khadi in the usual Sarkari way, not particularly well displayed or whatever. And very often you have the same Khadi bolt in cottage industries and you have it at Khadi, different prices and completely different customers. I mean, the person who goes into one store will probably never go to Khadi Bandai because they'll consider it too down market or too, you know, uh, Sarkari or whatever. So I think this is an advantage and uh, for craftspeople that they can really find the level of uh, market and customer that works for them. And that if you have a master craftsman who can make the most extraordinary piece of, um, let's say, Bandhani, and you, he can make a sari which can command a price of, say, 50 or 60,000 rupees, I think it's very silly to tell him to make little handkerchiefs with three or four dots on them. But at the same time, not every Bandhani craftsperson can make that sari and they shouldn't be sitting idle because there's no work for them. So one of the things that designers and entrepreneurs have to do is to actually study each craft community and see what is appropriate and find, and uh, I know that when I work myself with a craft community, I try to, first of all, do an analysis of how many people there are who are really top notch craftspeople who are the sort of medium range and who are the ones who are just learning and try to design and develop uh, products which fit for all of these and bring them and I think that that's more and more what craftspeople have to do and what designers and merchandisers who work with craftspeople have to do to make the best use of the skills that are available and make the best use of the raw material which is also going to be available. Are we running out of time? Are we, uh, what are we, how are we doing? We could actually uh, uh, get into the question and answer session if you're okay with that because we do have a few questions. Uh, yeah, Leila. so let me just uh, quickly, you want to just close, yeah. I'll just close and uh, say, so, uh, you know, one can go on talking endlessly about this both fascinating and also rather worrying situation of craftspeople. Uh, in the long term, it's a great, great advantage for India. As I said before, it's a gold mine that we haven't explored the potential of. But at this, at, at, in the immediate future, it is at risk. And I think that all of us have a part to play. I mean, uh, one is to think of all the things that crafts people can make and which you people can use and demand them and say that why aren't they available or why are they only available in a few little sort of string of specialized stores they should be everywhere in every marketplace and the other is to act as a kind of 
lobby and uh, um, a very tight pinch actually to our government to say that why are you ignoring this sector? Why is it that nowhere in five days of Nirmala Sitaraman telling us what was in that 20, what was it, how many crores um, package, uh, there was not a single mention of craftspeople. Now, isn't that extraordinary? The second largest investment uh, employment sector in the country, and you don't mention them. You talk of transplanetary travel, you talk of foot and mouth disease, you talk of I don't know what, but you don't mention craftspeople. And I think that because craftspeople are so scattered, they don't have a collective voice. And so it is for all of us, the other people in this country of ours, to remind the powers that be that we have craftspeople, but if we don't do something for them, we may not have them. Thank you. Thank you, Naina. That was that was so fascinating, and it just gave us uh, such a such a broad picture of you know different levels at which the craft uh, sector and the crafts people are uh, uh, neglected, undervalued, um, underinvested in. So uh, I just like to uh, uh, pause here and inform our uh, participants today that uh, Dastakar has actually reopened its uh, Dastakar Artisans Fund which was set up in the wake of the Kutch uh, earthquake in 2001. So do look up the uh, Dastkar website and uh, see how you would like to contribute to uh, uh, helping craftsmen, who craftspeople who have been impacted by the COVID crisis. Uh, we will get into the questions, uh, uh, Leila, now. And I think one top, one top most right now is just the the sheer invisibility uh, that the craft sector has, right? It, it has, it's the second largest employer. Uh, it's still with reverse migration, with all these people going back to the um, villages. There is going to be increased pressure on this sector to create jobs and create livelihoods. Uh, so two questions. One, uh, how, do we, uh, how do we create visibility around this sector? What are the narratives and stories that need to be told? What are the actions that need to be taken at the social sectors, uh, organizations working with art artisans? Um, what can be done to really build more visibility around it and also uh, really bring back, uh, restore its value and pride in a sense? Well, I think pride, uh, value and pride are the key words. Because sadly, even craftspeople themselves don't have much value and pride for what they do. Most of them are doing it because there's no alternative. Or because this is a family business, they've been going on doing it. I mean, a scary figure is that we lose 15% of our crafts population every decade. And I think that rate is going to be going up in the near future. And craftspeople have had such dhakkas with demonetization, with the very imperfect implementation of GST, which made, lost them almost a year's business. And now this lockdown, that uh, more and more craftspeople are going to be losing, uh, deciding that this is not for us. Uh, the opposite, the flip side of that is that, as you said, there are not going to be that many jobs around. So maybe Again, this is a pause for craftspeople to look at and say, well, at least we have this. At least we have something, we have a skill in our hands which doesn't cost us any money. We have a, a kind of a production process which doesn't require very expensive infrastructure. And so maybe let's go on. What I think we all have to do is to restore that pride for them and which we can only do by giving them a sense of social value. Unfortunately, in India, we don't actually respect craftspeople. I've talked of the attitude of the government, but I think it goes down the line that uh, we actually don't think that a craftsperson is a skilled professional. To, lay, to create the weft for an ikat sari, for instance, is 
as complicated and complex and requires as much mathematics and skill as doing computer programming. But if you put, I think if uh, a young girl told her mother that I want to marry an Ikat weaver, they would be shocked and horror. If she said, I want to marry a computer guy, he would be welcomed with laddus and pakoras. So I do think that that attitude we have to change. And unless we change our own attitudes to craftspeople and respect them and give them that social value, they are going to leave. It's not just a question of money. And I think that attitudinal change is something that we can all do. It's not very difficult. It doesn't cost us money, but we need to start doing it. Uh, the, the other question that came, you, you mentioned how we're losing about 15 to 20 percent of uh, uh, craftspeople every year, every decade. Uh, that will only increase now. But um, two questions related to that. One, how do we keep our uh, the younger generation of craftspeople inspired and interested to stay and you know carry on these uh, traditions? Or we're simply losing a piece of our history, right? If we lose these crafts. And also on the other side, on the demand side, how do we build awareness and an appreciation of Indian handicrafts among our youth, uh, the, the new market that is coming up? So, I think love that, your thoughts. I think that we have to talk about craft everywhere. We have to, I'm not very fond actually of speaking in public, but I go, I push myself to go to schools and colleges and universities and uh, organizations to talk about craft, to present craft, to show them visuals of what quality craft look like. Because many Indians who come from small towns today don't know that. I mean, if you go into even a design institute like Pearl or Nift or whatever, most of the young people really have not seen good craft. Some of us are lucky we've either inherited it or we've visited a museum or we've seen it in a coffee table book, but uh, a lot of Indians are completely unaware of the range and potential. So I think we have to promote that everywhere. I wish that there was a mega advertising program like Incredible India, which focused on the crafts that we have. That did so much for tourism in India. People really rediscovered their own country. And instead of just thinking of the Taj Mahal or Khajuha or whatever, they were suddenly going to all kinds of places. And I think if we could do that, if we could sort of get, I suppose only the government uh, could do it, but something like that, an Im imaginative, creative way of showcasing the real range of the crafts and having the crafts people tell us the stories of those things which link in so much with our own cultural stories. Which actually brings me to the question about um, how do you create these mar uh, market linkages? Now of course there was uh, e-commerce and the online marketplace was seen as at one point uh, uh, having the ability to revolutionize the craft sector. One, did it live up, it, uh, live up to its promise? And uh, two, going forward in the new uh, era, now you're also setting up with that car, uh, we're going online. So I just wanted to understand how can we maximize uh, that uh, uh, solution? In a sense. I think that we have to move that. I mean, in order for it to be effective, we have to see that you move it away from product from selling a product and showcasing a product a beautifully photographed whatever it may be and saying you want to buy it to marketing the production potential and to present the craftsperson and the skill and the technique and say look this is it here's a range of things which were made using this technique and this skill and this person and what would you like from that and to get orders so that it generates orders rather than individual retail sales and it also creates that awareness that god there is this powerhouse out there which can do so many things because i think actually awareness is at the bottom of it all so many of indian indian crafts were architectural crafts 
today you hardly see a contemporary building which uses craft except as maybe some sort of decor on the mantelpiece or whatever you don't see it used in doors and pillars and wall textures and you know uh, floor coverings all that so and i think again it's a lack of knowledge that architects and interior designers really don't know about how to go and even if they've seen it they don't know where it comes from who they should write to to place an order etc so that kind of networking and linkaging and information is as important as showcasing the product oh we have actually a participant from kashmir here she he sends his regards to all of us and i think uh, that that brings us to a question about how uh, uh crafts persons working in uh conflicted in uh, places and also now uh suffering from the impact of the covid uh, crisis uh what is your uh, reading of what's happening with uh, these people who are actually suffering the you know uh, the doubly uh, impacted and what extra efforts need to be put in to really uh, support these crafts people Well, Kashmir, of course, is very difficult. Daskar and I have been working in Kashmir now for a very long time, all through these conflict years. And of course, uh, Kashmir has a double lockdown. It was locked down for five, six months from last year, and uh, is still under some kind of lockdown because of an incident the other day. Again, the internet and Wi-Fi are not available. so for kashmir to communicate and kashmir was a country which was very de- uh, a place which was very dependent on external orders and sales and tourism sales and although practically every family in kashmir has someone who's involved in the craft business in some way either as a maker or as a seller or as a user uh, or you know in tourism where selling craft is also an ancillary part of that whole activity uh, the whole thing took a terrible blow because they don't have a local market at all and for us working there getting them orders has also been very difficult because you never know whether you can actually communicate that order to them whether once they've made it whether they're able to send it when we had a b2b event in uh, bangalore at the end of last year actually the craft people who were coming had to sneak out rather surreptitiously and uh, it was a terribly complicated business and i mean we were only showcasing samples if they had had to bring stock they wouldn't have been able to do it at all so it is very complex but on the other hand since as i said you know every negative has a positive and all that uh one thing that has happened is that when you have a very rich crafts community as in kashmir in, in spite of all this insurgency etc or you have a place like kutch which had this terrible earthquake in 2002 and it looked as if you know i mean i was there three or four days after the earthquake trying to do something and it seemed as if this whole district was literally in pieces and how could it come together i mean villages were destroyed people had died their stocks were gone everything and yet the fact that they were a craft community whose strength was in their hands and not dependent on an infrastructure of a factory or an employer or you know a government job or whatever they were actually able to come back together in a very strong and wonderful way and we were talking about this yesterday with uh, the kachi craft people that i was on a zoom uh, webinar with and uh, of course they pointed out to me that that was true and that kach in a way flourished after the initial devastation but they did say that there is a difference between in then and now is that then there was a market outside kach kach itself had been destroyed but there were markets there were buyers today of course everything is locked down and we really don't know how craft people are going to get out of this and 
I think we all have to think very imaginatively and creatively to find a solution. Uh, Lena, on the government level, what are the kind of uh, measures you would like to see, uh, of course, immediately for its immediate relief and also longer term? Uh, also thinking of things like um, like just the working conditions, right? How do what are the kind of investments required there at the infrastructure level? So, if you had to name the top two or three things that need to be done right away. Well, I mean, the main thing is that I want craft people. I want the craft sector to be treated like any other sector of economic activity. I don't want it to be either hidden away as something which is there because it's there and you know until these people learn to do something else we have to keep subsidizing them uh, i don't want them to be treated as if they are different and peculiar i want them to be looked at as a very viable and important part of our economic structure and be given the same aids and things there has been uh, no push for uh, i believe now when we raise the fact that uh, both in the last budget as well as in this economic uh, packet, uh, there was no mention of craft people. And we were told, well, they should uh, sort of apply under the MSME things and they should register themselves. Now, no one has really ever said that before. And also they don't quite fit into that because many of them are just sort of small family units, you know. They, I don't know exactly what the criteria of an MSME is, but, and I'm sure knowing the sort of red tape which we have inherited from the British, which is the one thing we desperately hang on to, uh, that the comp to applying is going to be quite complicated and it's not going to happen like overnight. Even the established MSMEs are finding it difficult to get that relief from the government. So, but this is my main thing that don't put craftspeople in a separate box. Treat them exactly like any other economically productive part of our country and give them the same sort of investment and support that you give other people. I mean, if uh, somebody who wants to start a computer small part factory can walk into any bank and get a loan, I won't say with the greatest ease, but certainly with some enthusiasm from the bank manager. But I have myself had that experience of going into banks and trying to get a loan for, for handloom weavers who have a confirmed order, international order, and the bank manager saying, no, oh, madam, yet a primitive calm hai, you know. Isko kya loan denge? And because class people seldom have collateral in the shape of a factory or something, they, they are again stuck. So I'm saying that, yeah, recognize them as a group of people who have great power and potential to get this country's economy uh, vibrant again. And there's no time like now where other players like China and uh, Singapore, etc., perhaps not as able as India to kick back because mercifully we have not had such high mortality as in other countries. And uh, so treat them like that. Also talk about them, promote them. Don't pity them. Don't shove them under the carpet, but give them their place in society. I think I'm just being greedy. I'm going to ask you one last question, Lena. Uh, and it's uh, really about a lot of people actually who are uh, participants today work with uh, craftspeople. And if you had one message today for them on how they can support uh, our craftspeople and our crafts in this time of crisis, and also what are the possibilities, like you said, of just building relationships of trust, of equal relationships, and not see them as someone you're helping but someone you're supporting because you need it for yourselves, right? It's part of our culture. So how do we do that? You're talking of designers and uh, entrepreneurs? Yes. Well, I think, again, I mean, they are so, so fortunate today to be living in a country which has all these amazing skills and techniques, most of which are very underutilized because everyone somehow jumps after the same lot of people, you know? 
uh, you managed to make uh, chicken embroidery sort of successful and then everybody wants to work with chicken embroidery somebody you know sees something else and that all over india there are pockets of extraordinary craft people and unique techniques that have not been seen in this country sometimes but certainly not internationally i would say to anyone a young entrepreneur starting off in this very difficult world or young designer one of the hundreds that come out of our design schools every year that go and find a group of craft people or weavers or whatever who i have not who are not in the marketplace not whom you've met at a daskai bazaar or at dilli hat and who are already there but someone who's not and there are literally thousands of them and invest in that start working with them do it that is what actually daskar has been doing over the years we don't have uh, great funds we are not amazing professional and highly skilled people but we are willing to spend that time you can't start um, making money immediately but we have i think worked over the years in the sort of uh, 4 38 years of daskar we worked with about i think 950 plus uh, groups of craft people all across 25 states um, and the process is the same you see their skill you see how you can develop it you can see how they can make it into something that's going to sell in the market you give them design you help them uh, hone their production systems all that and i can tell you that out of 950 i think there are about two which just didn't become sustainable or and folded up in the end it doesn't take much money it doesn't take much skill but it takes time and persistence and when you put the thing i mean we have seen over and over again whether it was a sandhu lambani embroidery which nobody had ever heard of or kasuti or chicken curry which had become completely defunct and people used to wear to go to bed in you know it was this crude shadow work no one had even remembered including craft people themselves that there used to be 35 different stitches in chicken embroidery and so but it was really it took i think something like 9 uh, months before we did our first exhibition which was a total sell out and of course then everybody whether it was itu kumar whether it was abu jani or whatever they all took it and now chicken is a integral part of the indian clothing scene uh, but you have to be a little uh, sort of say that i don't want to make a quick buck and i'm willing to work at it and craft people and the craft process is a little slow so you need to be prepared for that but it has the most amazing potential for growth and i would say to young people today that my god you should think how lucky you are look what countries like uh, indonesia or thailand which have maybe three crafts you know i mean they have basketry they have weaving they have something else and look what they've done look how they've made it an international business and look at the quality and look at the design and look at the innovation i don't know why i think we're just too used to craft people and we're too complacent about it and we don't find it exciting as i said like the kutubinar craft is worth exploring thank you so much leila that was that was lovely and i'm sure uh, leaves us all inspired and um, reconnected with this rich uh, culture that rich culture of handicrafts that we completely totally must support at this point in time uh, thank you uh, thank you participants for joining us today a quick reminder that um, to first of all visit daskar visit their online store and also uh, visit the uh, daskar um, artisan fund um and um, do your bit for our, our crafts uh, secondly do look up ilss our website india leaders for social sector.com and uh, for more information on our 9 day leadership program which is coming up in august and also register for our future webinars um couple of them coming up soon thank you and have a good weekend
Thank you. Bye bye. Bye, Leila. Thank you so much. And you will be doing yourselves a favor, not craftspeople. You will be yourself. Absolutely. Have such joy and fun. Bye bye. Absolutely.